Welcome to Labor Day weekend. We are so excited that you're here. Uh, you know, when I was a young pastor, I hated Labor Day, July 4th, Memorial Day, all the holidays, right, around summer because you knew, hey, it's low attendance. And uh, once I was in ministry for a while, I tried to get younger associate pastors to, we, we would designate someone pastor holiday. And they preached on all those days, right? And, uh, well, uh, I am, I, I, I guess I've turned the corner. And now in my 50s, um, I see rest and recovery and refreshment through a different lens, right? And uh, I understand that that, too, is part of God's plan for us, right? He was the one that created the principle of Sabbath that there's a time to be away. And so uh, the, the vocabulary that we frame around that here at Bay Life is simply this. If you're away resting, recuperating, refreshing with your family, then be away. Don't think about us. But if you're in town, be at Bay Life, right? Because we want to gather when we're available to be with one another. It is so precious. So for those that are away, we are so thankful for them. And for those of you that came, we are so thankful for you. And I happen to believe that God puts the people in the room uh, on a particular Sunday for particular reasons. Maybe there's someone here that you were supposed to run into, someone here that you were supposed to meet for the very first time, someone that you needed to encourage in particular, or maybe there's something from the message that God wants specifically for you today. Whatever it is, I am excited to see God's will fulfilled right here this morning. Would you pray with me as we kick things off this morning? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, that for so many, this is going to be a weekend of refreshment and encouragement and restoration as people gather with families in various places. And, uh, but Father, for us that are here this morning, we pray that our spirit too would be refreshed and that we would be rejuvenated by the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for meeting us here, God. And Father, I pray that as we open your word that you would, as you always do, faithfully proclaim it to our hearts through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, welcome to the last week of a series that we have entitled, This Is My Church. And what we've been doing in this series is really kind of going on a journey together. We've been finding or identifying four steps that I've found over 35 years of ministry that these are four steps that lead us on a journey from a place where we can say, hey, I enjoy this church, to I'm fully engaged in the mission of this church. That's what our heart is for every one of us, that we would be able to say, this is my church. So when can a person say that? When do we get far enough in the journey that we can really say, this is my church? Well, uh, in this series, we've laid out these four steps. And in week one, we said, we can say, this is my church. When I invest and invite, when I invest relationally and then leverage that to invite them into a gospel conversation and a gospel community like the one here at Bela. So if you're in that group of people who is at some point throughout the year, you're investing and inviting. Maybe you're using this card that's on your seat to, uh, to hand it to a neighbor, to hand it to the waitress at the restaurant you're going to go to after I get done preaching. Uh, wh whenever it is, maybe God has laid someone in particular on your heart. You're just going to give them this. Uh, say, hey, we would, we'd love to have you with us uh, at Bay Life this next week. But uh, we can say, hey, this is my church when I'm investing and inviting. Then in week two, uh, we said... Uh, we can say this is my church when we serve on a team, when we serve on a dream team to help fulfill the mission of Bay Life Church. And then last week we said, I can say this is my church when I connect in a group for the purpose of fellowship and spiritual development, right? That I've made myself accountable to a group of my fellow Bay Lifers 
and we're doing life together and we're being real with one another together and we're opening God's word together and we are becoming fully formed followers of Jesus together. We talked about that one-two punch of large group on the weekend where we're getting valuable information and then small group where we're processing that and we're moving forward in our desire to be more like Jesus. And as Pastor Mike pointed out, you have this here. Uh, one of the values in our group's ministry is this. Uh, we're a multi-generational church, and we like multi-generational groups. And so three or four of these groups um, really focus on that mentoring process. So that there will be people in that group that look like me and are my age, and then there will be people that be like my kids' age and that generation who are raising young families. And uh, what my kids have told me, uh, because I just assumed when they all moved down here that they would just want groups that were just young couples. And they're like, oh, my heavens, no. Uh, we're old enough to know what we don't know. And we want to be in with some mentor couples, but not you, Mom, not you, Dad, but we'd like some other mentor couples from this church. And so Scott and Gardner and Bethany and Steve Cook, one of, one of our daughters, uh, they formed a group, and that group has just blown up, and they are doing so well in that mentoring uh, zone. And, and so other groups, uh, Pastor Mike and his wife Sarah are going to kind of lead a group in that vein, and Diane and I are kind of restarting a brand new group, and we're going to go after that. And Stanley and Myrna and Tom and Diane LaCopla are leading a group, and they're going to mentor some young couples. And uh, we just think that's so valuable. And so if you're my age and you think you've got maybe something to say to a younger couple, or if you're a younger couple looking for some mentoring relationships, there are great opportunities for that. Uh, what you see on the card is all of our, what we call Bay Life groups. These are kind of uh, Bay Life specific groups. And then we have another set of groups that are Bay Life community groups, which are really open to the public as well. And those are men's groups and women's groups, and uh, we have about four of those, and including our Bay Life moms. And just pray for that because that's kind of blown up. We kind of went public with that, and we got 30 or 40 registrations online from people that don't even come here, young moms that are looking for community. So pray for the ladies leading that ministry. Um, but God is doing some amazing things in our group's ministry. And so you ought to be able to say, this is my church. If you said, hey, we connect in a group, we make that a priority. Well, week four, what's the last step where I can say, this is my church when, and it's this, when we give generously to support the mission of Bay Life Church. Uh, this is where it maybe gets a little quiet in the room. I, regardless of what church, uh, of the five churches that I've pastored, uh, there, there are different perspectives on this. And I'll talk to some people and they'll go, well, that's probably my least favorite topic to hear preached about, a giving message. So I want to give you a little insight into the way your pastor sees this. I think this is one of the disciplines of the Christian life that I get most excited about about leading people into. Well, why do I feel that way? Because it's a game changer. The grace of giving, the generosity piece is a total game changer. I have seen it produce some of the most significant and rapid change in the lives of people when their heart is opened with the generosity discipline with the grace of giving. I love teaching on this because it has given me and so many that I know a front row seat to see the power of God unleashed in your life and through your life into the lives of others. I love teaching on this because generosity has a comprehensive effect on anything your money touches, which is almost everything in your life, okay? There's a reason why Jesus taught on this topic more than almost any other topic, including talking about heaven and hell. He talked about the grace of giving and about the generosity piece more than any of those other things. In our family, and we kind of have some specific vocabulary around things that Diane and I really value and care about in teaching our seven kids, and the way that we would talk about generosity is this. 
uh, generosity is not something that we've got to do. Generosity is something that we get to do, right? Uh, let me give my personal testimony on this. I would say this, generosity has changed my life, totally. It's changed my life. It has given me a vision of what the power of God looks like. I've had a front row seat to see some of the coolest things ever. It has changed every facet of my life for the better. When Diane and I were dating, it was kind of, we were weird. It was kind of our first date and uh, uh, where we had committed to each other and we knew, hey, this is the one for me. And uh, so we sat down and we're at a restaurant. Both of us took a napkin and we wrote out the top five goals that we had for our kids, that we would want this for our kids. And I know that's kind of crazy, but maybe God already knew that we we're going to have seven and, and 10 plus grandkids and all that sort of stuff. And we we're going to spend the bulk of our life raising kids. And so we wrote out these five things. Uh, there was only one matching item. Both of us had put as number one on our list of five things we wanted for our kids, generosity. We wanted our kids to be generous. Now, we wanted that for completely different reasons. Diane wanted our kids to be generous because she had come from a family that was fairly affluent, but could get a, a dime out of every penny. I mean, they were just so, and it, was, it was frugal to a place that was unhealthy, right? And she wanted us to raise generous kids because she had not grown up in a generous home. And I wanted to raise generous kids because I had grown up in a home that had very little money, but we were radically generous with everything that we had. And so coming from two totally different perspectives, we knew this was going to be a key for our family. Generosity is huge. Let, let me talk about generosity at Bay Life for a moment. Uh, we've had our doors open as Bay Life Church for 18 months, almost exactly 18 months. And I get so excited when I think about the generosity of this place. Generosity and the grace of giving has been one of kind of the silent disciplines here at Bay Life. The people of Bay Life, by and large, are very generous. And so I get so excited as a pastor uh, because I know what that means for us as a church. I know what God will do and can do. And I get excited about teaching about this 18 months in because I believe God's about to do some amazing things at Bay Life. The train's about to leave the station. We're about to unleash our second full season of ministry. And more people are going to get saved and more people are going to get discipled. And we're going to send more teams out to globally to the mission field. And, and so much is going to happen. And I don't want to leave anyone behind. And I know this. That if I can't fully say, this is my church, then you're going to feel like you're left behind. If you're not investing and inviting, if you're not serving on a dream team, if you're not connecting in a small group, if you're not graciously giving to support the mission of this place, when great things happen and I get up and we celebrate and everybody claps and you, it'll just kind of not feel the same because... You're not yet fully in. And hey, Bay Life is a safe place for you to go on that journey. And everyone takes that journey at different speeds. And you arrive at the destination at different times. I'm just, this is my one chance a year to encourage you. Hey, come with us. Come with us. You're going to want to have a front row seat. So report card time uh, for Bay Life. And I've kind of been doling these numbers out as we've gone through each of the four steps, but I want to give them to you all at once because I think there's some value in that, okay? I'm kind of a numbers guy, a metrics guy, but it seems like Jesus was. He counted things all the time. That's how we know there were 5,000 that he fed and uh, 3,000 at another time, and we know that 3,000 people got saved on Pentecost and because they counted, right? And so metrics matter. It shows us if we're winning. So I look at the measure of full engagement, these four steps. 
So invest and invite is by far the hardest one to track. How do we actually know that you're investing and inviting? And Well, you tell us and you introduce us to guests who come and, and uh, you let us know, oh, I'm so sad I was expecting my friend and they decided not to come. And we pray with you about that. And so we have a sense. And I would say, I think we're about halfway there. I think we're about one out of two people at some point throughout the ministry year, invest in a relationships and invite someone to come into a gospel community like the one here at Baylight. So 50%, I get excited about that. We're going to clap at the end so you can just kind of hold your applause. But uh, how about serve on a dream team? And I shared this when we taught that week, and it's 66%. 60, two out of three are actively serving. That is excites me 18 months in that two out of three are on a dream team that means you're serving at least monthly many of you serve twice a month and some of you serve every single week and we are so amazed but could not do what we do here without your service how about connect in a small group well we've got some room to grow here we're at about 53 percent so we're about halfway there right all these numbers our desire is 100 percent right full engagement of everyone in the body but uh, in a small group 53% that means that some of us need to go home and take this card and actually pray actually have a conversation uh, with our spouse actually have a conversation with our boss to say you know what Mondays I can't work late anymore or Wednesdays I can't work late anymore I've made a priority to be in community with people at my local church and I've, I've got to carve that time out okay um, how about giving uh, so encouraged by this of those who have given something you gave a penny over the last year we're at 79 percent almost eight out of ten people now can we just thank god for what's going on in our church that is so encouraging and now that we've praised god we didn't clap for ourselves but we praise god right so now the discipleship begins here, okay? So I want to take you on a little bit of a journey when it comes to the grace of giving thing. Because one thing we can never do, uh, we understand we're going to give an account before God for us. Um, I, don't have to, I, I don't get credit for what the person next to me is doing or the person across the room from me is doing. And I would say that Bay Life, based on national standards, way ahead in terms of the number of people engaged in giving and way ahead in terms of what's being given, right? The national average, in case you're curious, is about $20 per person or per attendee in an evangelical church, about 20 bucks a week. And we're just north of 60 bucks a week. So we're at 3x what the national average is. And so as a church, I would say, go God, radically healthy. But okay, we know we all give an account for ourselves. Okay, so I want to show you a chart. I want to kind of walk you through this. But before we put the chart up, uh, I want you to know something. <laughs> Did he put it up and take it back down? Way to go, Brandon. Uh, Brandon is our volunteer of the week. We were all over social media about Brandon this week and love him so much. And he does an amazing job back there. Um, before I walk you through that chart, I want you to know an important thing. I have no idea what you do. None. Okay. We have people who have that assignment and are signed a document for strict confidentiality, and that's that's how it is here at Baylife. Okay. So if you're worrying, uh, you know, I have no idea. Uh, but I get the people who do know to do logistical analysis for me because if I'm going to shepherd and care for the life of this church family, I do have to know kind of where we're at. And so I know big picture. Um, so let's take you to this chart. Um, if we start at the bottom, this is with those of us that give something, right? You give a dollar, you give five dollars, you could give a hundred thousand dollars, whatever. But you give something, that's eight out of ten, that's 79 percent. That's a really, really high number. I've pastored for 35 years, that's the highest that number has ever been for me. Okay, that's awesome. How about those of us that give occasionally? This is, this is so exciting to me when I see the occasional giver. And let me tell you why. It means that you're beginning to move and you're beginning to grow. 
and you're beginning to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God and saying, hey, you, you ought to get your checkbook out. You, you ought to give to that. And, and so you're starting to listen, and, and that means spiritual progress. And I would say that's about half of us. About half of us would be in that category of we give, maybe when Pastor Dimitri was here the other week and you heard about 150,000 people without water or electricity in the city of Maripool that's still under attack. 150,000 mostly elderly people who may die this winter. I'm telling you, when you heard that testimony, people came up and gave me checks and put cash in my hand and said, please get this to Dimitri. And we were able to bless them with several thousand dollars before they went back to Russia. And some of you will give online toward that. And that's, that's, that's what it feels like to, when, when that generosity, the grace of giving starts to perk in your heart, uh, you, you enter that category, and that's a sign of spiritual progress, and I get excited about that. How about the gives biblically? That sounds a little daunting. Um, well, Scripture actually has a standard, right? And uh, uh, the standard of giving, uh, I would summarize in three words. It's this. Uh, it's priority. Biblical giving is a priority giving. Uh, the scripture talks all the time about first fruits. This comes ahead of my mortgage. It comes ahead of my light bill. It comes ahead of whatever, fill in the blank. It's a priority in my life that I realize that everything I have comes from the Lord. And so giving a portion back to him, that's first thing, right? First thing. It's priority. It's proportional. Everywhere in scripture that talks about biblical giving, it talks about proportional. It's a percentage of income, right? And I'm not here to make some big statement or do some long teaching on what that percentage is. I, I will say that I grew up with kind of the standard of the tithe. That's a dime out of every dollar. I remember my parents handed out our allowance on Saturday night. Why? So that we could prepare our tithe for Sunday morning. You know what my opening allowance was? One dollar a week. Do you think my parents gave me paper money? Not a chance. How does a kid turn paper money into a tithe? How could I give out of a single dollar bill my tithe? So they gave it to me, guess what? In what denomination? They gave it to me in dimes. I got 10 dimes. And okay, Brian, did you prepare your, and what that meant in our house is you took one of the 10 dimes and you put it on your dresser and that went in your pocket. And then at lunch, guess what my pot pastor father asked? Did you give your tithe? Wow. I'm talking six, seven years old with early training in the Piffing household, right? Um, and it was just. That, that was it. We, we came to understand it was proportional. And then it's progressive. This is the really, really cool part about the grace of giving. Is as God prospers us. As I, I, by the way, thank you, Baylife Church. I no longer make $1 a week. <laughs> and uh, nor can I afford to work for $1 a week. I'll just say that. But uh, you know what? As God has prospered us and given us more and trusted us with more, guess what? We've been able to give more. I, it, it, a lot of us have accountability partners for a variety of reasons. I actually have an accountability partner in giving. It's another pastor friend of mine. And uh, when we do our taxes, this is how we keep accountability. When we do our taxes on the page where we report our charitable giving, we take a picture and send it to the other person. Why do we do that? Because we want to encourage one another in the grace of giving. Right? And I want to grow and I want to be progress. I want to be pushed to do more. So, so cool. That's biblical giving. And then beyond that is that progressive part, right? It's the gives generously. It's the above and beyond that, yes, I do what, what God requires. But then beyond that, I'm listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And there are so many people here that are at that level. And I'm so thankful for you. And I want to say this. I am thankful for everyone on every step of this journey. See, me getting to talk to you about this is not about shame and guilt and heaviness. It 
It's about celebration. And the celebration gets louder as the journey continues, right? Now, we've had a long family chat. I want to get into God's word because I'm going to unleash five principles rapid fire that I think will change wherever you are on that chart. It will accelerate your growth, okay? I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 so you can follow along in your version uh, or your app or just follow along on the screens here. Uh, but I want you to know this. If no pastor has ever planted this truth about giving in your life, let me be the first. Generosity is something that God wants for you, not from you. Did you hear that? Generosity is something God wants for you, not from you. Okay? Let's dive in. 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 10. I want to read these first two verses. He, this is God, who supplies seed to the sower. The sower is you and me, right? And bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, we're going to see the greater context. We're going to kind of zoom out from where we started here. But I want you to know the greater context is going to teach us this. That when it comes to generosity, when God sees that he can trust our heart to be generous, when we have a cup full of provision and we pour it out generously for others and for the mission of God, guess what God does? He refills the cup. And he trusts us with bigger cups. And hopefully one day you get to that place where you're pouring it out with a bucket. God will do that. The God who provides the bread that you need to eat, the shelter, the food, the clothing, uh, all that you need. He will multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness if you will learn to unleash generosity in your life. Now... I told you I'm going to unleash these five principles, and we're going to do it pretty rapid fire. But before I get there, I want to answer the question, why? Why would you be generous? It's not because Bay Life has a budget, or Bay Life has bills, or we have salaries to be paid. It's not in none of those reasons. The psalmist David in Psalm 36 gives us the why. I want to read that to you. The psalmist David said this, how precious is your steadfast love. He's talking to God. The only reason we would be generous is because he first loved us. Because of his love for us. That is the only reason. Don't give another dime if it is not for this reason. Because he first loved us. Us. How precious is your steadfast love, oh God. The children of mankind, who's among the children of mankind? We could all raise our hand, right? We're part of humanity. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. It is his provision of love and his protection of our life that we are sheltered under the wings of the Almighty. What a beautiful picture. They feast... On the abundance of your house. Sometimes, because things are scarce in our house, we think that things are scarce in God's house. Not true. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He can meet every need. I don't know how he's going to do that, but he can meet every need, right? We feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your delights. That's my favorite line in the verse. I want some of that. Let me drink from the river of delights. Right? One last line here. For with you is the fountain of life. Remember John 4, he met the woman at the well and she was there getting real water and he said, I can give you living water. This is what he's talking about, the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. We have the light of life because Jesus, who is the light of the world, came and gave his life on a cross. 
There is no greater reason than his love and his death, burial, and resurrection. That is the why. That's why we give at all. Okay? If you're ready to write and you're a note taker, let's get these five principles quickly. The first principle uh, is this. Generosity saves lives. I want to say generosity changes lives. Right? Generosity changes lives. Ralph Waldo Emerson said it best. He said this, uh, the purpose of life is not to be happy, it's to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. How do, how do you do that? How do you live well? You have a generous heart, right? You have a generous heart. Heart. Generosity changes lives, not just financially. It, generosity, and I've seen it, and you've seen it time and again, it opens the hearts of, the, uh, of hardened people to the gospel. When we're generous with them, it encourages the soul that's depressed. It can refresh and renew relationships. That's why so many of you gave to just kind of spontaneously to Pastor Dimitri so that when he goes back, they can keep taking those humanitarian trips and handing out food to the hungry and water to those who don't have it. Why? So that he can share the gospel with them. Right? Let's step into the text here in verse 12. It says, for the ministry of this service. What's he talking about? The, the Corinthian church had given a massive offering to help ease the hunger of those who were in famine in the region of Judea, specifically in the church at Jerusalem. It says, for this ministry, the ministry of generosity, is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, and then it goes on, and we'll read the next uh, line in a bit, but uh, let's change that since we're treating it as a standalone here. Their offering fully supplied the needs of the church in Jerusalem. Now, that is significant. Why? This was a massive famine. It was so big a famine that Josephus wrote about it in his histories called the Antiquities. And Tacitus wrote about it in his history of the world called the Annals. They wrote about this particular famine. It was such a massive famine that Agabus, who was a, a prophet in the book of Acts, predicted that they would have this massive famine. He, he tried to prepare the church for it. In fact, after Agabus gave his prophecy of this coming famine, in Acts chapter 11, verse 29, it says, So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it by the elders, by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the offering Paul's talking about. He had received an offering from the Corinthian church for relief of this particular Famine, And it says, your gift, the Corinthian gift, fully supplied the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. They must have given a massive gift. You and I, if we have generous hearts, will find ourselves, there will be times in our lives where we'll have a front row seat to see lives change forever because of your generosity. Uh, Tom and Diane LaCopla, great friends of ours. They're not here today. They're traveling. It's Labor Day weekend. They're up in the Carolinas. And uh, I remember when I first met Tom in one of our churches in Chicago, and uh, he had a heart to go to Africa. He didn't really know why, but uh, I was going on a trip. And so I said, hey, Tom, why don't you come with me? And so we went to Uganda. We were working with Pastor Robert. Many of you have met Pastor Robert. I've known him for almost 20 years since. And so uh, we're there, and uh, Robert had a school, and so many kids in the school, and uh, he worked in the slums of uh, Kampala, a, a suburb called Kowempe, and uh, people live in terrible conditions. Dirt floors, open sewage, houses that are like eight by eight, with a family of five living inside there. Not enough food, no medical care. And those kids come to Pastor Robert's school, and so Tom got there, and any time, first time in Africa, it's just overwhelming. It's just the need is so massive. And, um, and Tom, prompting of the Holy Spirit, he responded. He, 
He said, I wonder how much it would cost in U.S. dollars to change the life of one of these kids. I said, well, let's go ask. And Pastor Robert went off with his wife, and they prayed about it, and they did some numbers. And what would it cost to provide Christian education tuition for them uh, for a year? And what would it cost for them to get two meals a day? And what would it cost for a mosquito net? And what would it cost for two medical checkups? All of that total game changers. And they came back with the number, $36 a month. And I remember Tom sat down, and he's an Italian from the south side of Chicago. It means they're not emotional people. Well, they're emotional, but it's all negative emotion, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and Tom sat down, and he just got emotional. He, he wept. And he said, you mean for my Starbucks money, I can change the life of a kid? And you know what? Not only did Tom decide to change the life of one kid, but he started in our church there in Chicago, he started a sponsorship program for kids. And at the peak of that program, we were sponsoring 150 kids to go to that school. Game changer. You know, Tom still supports the little boy that he started supporting. In fact, I, have, I had him send me a picture of the first day that he met Douglas. And Douglas, this little boy, and his shirt is all stretched and open because he has the distended belly from malnutrition and parasites and so forth. Uh, check out this picture. This is my friend Tom and Douglas. Well, Douglas, and I got to go to Douglas's house, play floor. He had a potato, a potato sack, a croaker sack that was his bed on the, on the clay floor, water running through the house. Uh, not enough food to feed their family. About six years later, Tom was back in Africa for another trip that he was now leading. And let's go to the next picture. This is what Douglas looks like. Game changer. And now Douglas is in high school, and he's almost as tall as I am, and he's strong, and he's a soccer player. And he's going to go to university because Tom and Diane are going to send them to university. And uh, every now and then, if you, have, if you determine to have a generous heart and to be open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit of God, you have no idea what you're going to get to see. You're going to have a front row seat to see hundreds of lives changed if you'll just... Open up your heart to generosity. Well, number two, generosity is a megaphone for our worship of God. Check this out. It says in the text, not only fully supplying the needs. So that was the first thing, the offering from the Corinthians did. It fully supplied the needs in Jerusalem, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. You put a microphone or a megaphone in the hand of every person that you bless with generosity because the first thing they want to do is praise God. There's a great command about how we're all supposed to praise God. It's in Psalm 72. Check it out. It says, may his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. You want to be part of all nations calling him blessed? Be a generous person. Generosity is a megaphone. Would you allow me just 60 seconds to praise God because of your generosity? You know, the first time that I saw your generosity at work was the 30 or 40 people that were, that would eventually become the launch team for Bay Life. You didn't pick us. I'm, I'm sorry for that. There was not even a discussion. It was just Paul Smith showed up and said, here's your new pastor. And uh, no one ran out screaming out of the room or whatever. The first time I saw your generosity is when you opened your hearts to us and made a home for us in your hearts. And you know what? Our kids saw that, and they've all kind of moved down here, well, almost all of them. And, uh, and that's we will never forget that. We're so blessed by that. I want to praise God because you, through serving in our four ministry, have touched over 750 people. in a, This little church has touched the lives of 750 people in our community, and the number grows all the time. There is a, a family in Mexico. We showed you this picture not too many months ago. 
because of the generosity of this place and the people who went have a brand new two-bedroom house in Mexico free of charge given to them because the people of this church are generous. There are refugees and orphans in the Ukraine and Russia who had food and clothing, who were cared for, and their suffering was alleviated because of your generosity. Because of your generosity, six students in Uganda went to university and they would not have had that opportunity. Because of your generosity, 15 foster families had Christmas for their foster kids in the Bay Areas because of your generosity. May, may we be generous so that people will be given a megaphone to praise and worship God. Number three, generosity is a proof of obedience to the gospel. Check out verse 13. It says this, because of the proof given by this ministry, what ministry? The ministry of generosity. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. Generosity is living, tangible proof that we are committed to the message of the gospel. What is the message of the gospel? It is the greatest message of generosity ever written. That God loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son who gave his life on a cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day to offer eternal life to people who were sinful, people who had rejected him. There is no greater message of generosity than this, for God so loved the world that he gave. Right? And when we are generous we give living proof, as the text says, that we are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do we do this? Because of Jesus. That's why our shirts, when we go out and serve in the community, do not say Bay Life Church. They say for Baldwin. So that people will ask, what does that mean? We are for you because God is for you. We're giving because God has given so much to us. That's the only reason we do this. It's the only reason that we're generous. At least it's the best reason. Principle number four, generosity builds affection for one another. It's my favorite of the five. Generosity builds affection. You want to be a part of a loving church? Any church you've ever been in that was loving was generous. I'm just saying they go together. It comes from the same place, an open heart, right? The Apostle Paul says how the people in Jerusalem had responded, okay? Let's check out the text. It says, while they also, that's the Jerusalem church, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. I want to pull three words out real quick. They prayed for you. The, the regular Greek word for prayer is prosepkeme. You don't need to know that, except that word is not used here. It's deisis is the word. It's a special prayer for God to supply the need of the other person. It's a very specific word. He's saying they are praying that God would replace the money that you gave so that you can be generous again. Is that so cool? It says they yearn for you. That's a very intense word that says they have deep affection. They owe you their life. That's what it means when it says they yearn for you. And then it talks about because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Notice it didn't say because of your surpassing grace for them. It doesn't come from us. What we're giving to them, God gave to us. Right? The surpassing grace of God in you. That word surpassing is an athletic term. It means to throw it beyond the boundary. Think about a home run into the second deck. That's how God's grace had shown up in the lives of the Corinthians, that they threw it out of the park. I can't wait 
for us as a church to have that opportunity. It's coming. God's going to put us in the path of something that's going to need all that we have and more. And we're going to get a front row seat to see it change lives forever. Last one, and we're done. Generosity reflects the character of Christ. Uh, verse 15, last one in the paragraph. Thanks be to God for what? For his indescribable gift. Wow. We're back to the why. There's only one reason why. Because of his indescribable There's an old, old commentator. His last name is Wingish. Uh, he said this, God's exquisite generosity cannot be adequately captured in human words. And then he says this, and this is the part you may have heard. He says, we are never more like Christ than when we are being generous. Wow. Um, I am so blessed others have been generous to me. I could take the next 10 minutes and just tell you about how people have been generous, to how they just threw it out of the park, generous to us when we needed it. I think of when we so desperately wanted our kids to have a great Christian school education and we were in the city of Chicago and were very necessary. Uh, and we didn't have the money. I remember my parents, who had less money than we did, said, we will go without whatever we have to go without in order to help you put your kids in school. I think of the time when we were moved of God to open our hearts and adopt two kids from Russia. And, and we found out it was going to cost $50,000. And I think total in savings, we had eight grand. And I can tell you that at the end of that time, 18 months, God had paid every bill. I think of the times when God called us as pastors of a church to do crazy things and how people stepped up. And, and I, I want you to know that the generosity that Diana and I embrace is a gift we were given first from our Heavenly Father, and then it was modeled for so many by so many godly people in our life. And if that can be our role here, along with so many others who are radically generous, that we could mentor others in this grace of giving. Guys, it's a life changer. It's a game changer. It's a front row seat for the greatest show on earth. Why would you want to miss that? Would you pray with me? Father, we all walk away from this message with different thoughts because we're at different places in our journey. And God, I just pray for the person who's just getting started and they're just maybe for the very first time hearing how all of this works. God, I pray that they would walk out of here not heavy-hearted, but light-hearted, excited about their next step in this journey. And Father, for those that, that are at that occasional giving, they just started listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and, and follow his prompting. And God, I just pray that they would take that next step uh, toward full obedience. And Father, thank you for all those people, all those families here at Bay Life for whom this is a long established grace in their life. And Father, I pray that you would develop them. And God, as we have opportunity to give above and beyond, God, stretch us even now. Lord, we want to bless others so that they would have a megaphone to praise God with so that lives would be changed, so that we would demonstrate our commitment to the gospel, so that we would demonstrate the character of Christ who gave an indescribable gift. Father, we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear me this week, Bay Life Church. I 
love you, every one of you, so much. God is about to do amazing things. Let's all get a front row seat. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to invite for the weekend.